So the family, we cannot underestimate the importance of the family to, to a healthy society. When families break down, then this leads to all kinds of problems uh, in the society around us. And this is, of course, what we see today happening uh, in America and throughout the world. All the social problems that we see around us find their origin in the breakdown of family. That's because the family was meant to be the place where we learn about God's ideal, experience it, uh, experience God's love, and then are able to go out and to share that and create something positive in our relationships with others. Okay, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Sorry. So part of God's ideal is ideal families. Meaning that, you know, of course, there are going to be challenges in any family. Even ideal families will have their challenges. Uh, love is something that is not automatic, but something that we have to learn to do. Learn to uh, give and receive love with others. So in every, every family, every relationship will have its challenges. Challenging are the limits of our ability to love and to receive love. So happy marriages uh, doesn't mean that you... Uh, live happily ever after and you never have a, uh, an argument with your spouse. But we have to, through, the, through these difficulties, through the conflicts that may arise, we learn how to deal with these things, deal with these challenges, and the end result, it helps us to grow and develop as human beings. So the ultimate goal is to become, find personal fulfillment and to perfect love in our own lives according to God's design. So all of this eventually leads to helping us to become, to grow and become the people that we're destined to be, fulfilling our potential and becoming God's own children. So I just want to finish up by talking about, you know, uh, talk here about God's ideal. But we know the reality is different, and uh, our next speaker, Dr. Pence, is going to talk more about this. But I just wanted to introduce this, the issue of evil, because for many people, when we talk about God's existence, they find it very difficult to believe in a God that allows evil in the world. This is reflected in this uh, statement by this French author, Dominique Morin, who wrote, If God existed and was good and all-powerful, as believers affirm, He could not have allowed evil and suffering. Here lies the root of many of people's atheism. If God exists, why does he allow this curse? The problem seems insoluble. So for many people who, who are atheists or become atheists, they cannot reconcile the existence of evil with a good and all-powerful God. So to explain evil, we basically have two choices. Either God is not absolutely good, or God is not all-powerful. You cannot have, if God is, all, is good, absolutely, and all-powerful, how can there be evil? Impossible. What about if we think that God is not absolutely good? If so, there would be an inherent contradiction everywhere throughout the universe. Good and evil would be everywhere, if this were true. But this is not what we see. We see that actually evil is confined to human society. So animals may kill one another, uh, but we would not call it evil. We don't haul in a, a lion into court for murdering some, another lion. Uh, they're following a, 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 there are certain instincts in their behavior. And we are the only species that will consistently, that consistently uh, destroy and kill another one of our species on a regular basis. We do not see that happening anywhere else. So, we cannot say that God, God cannot be all good. What about the, the point about God not being all powerful? Uh, so Reverend Moon, in the, when, in he, as he developed his relationship with God and his understanding of God's truth and God's principles, came to realize in a sense God is not really all powerful, but that God voluntarily limits his power in order to respect man's free will, to preserve our creativity, and for the sake of love. God does not want to control us. We are not robots or machines, but God wants us to be free 
so that we can be, be creative like God is and so that also we can love like God does and that we can respond freely to God's love for us. God is our heavenly parent. Parents cannot force their children to love them, right? Anybody who's a parent here knows that. Uh, love must be given freely and God will never interfere with man's free will. Uh, this is a very important point. So those who are atheists, I believe, have a, have a mistaken view of God. God is not an oppressive dictator wanting to control us. God does not judge and condemn us. God is not sitting on some high throne unaffected by human affairs. Rather, God himself is suffering. In the Bible it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. <clears throat> this reflects the true heart of God, looking at the situation of the world. And Reverend Moon also said, Even now, when I consider for whom I have wept tears all my life, I cannot deny that I came to know and cry for God. I received persecution, not because I am stupid. I could endure because I knew that God had gone through even worse suffering. If we can understand this aspect, this, this is the true situation of God, then this develops our hearts and our compassion, not only for one another situation, but for God as well. I believe God is waiting for us to really become mature children who can take responsibility to relieve the suffering in God's heart and to make a better world. Thank you very much. Okay, so this issue of God, the, 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 as Dr. Beebe was discussing, well, okay, the soon-to-be Dr. Beebe, uh, was discussing God's greatest gift to us is freedom, and I really strongly believe in that. And but we also have this contradiction because the God of freedom is also giving us commandments and rules. So it, it, there, there is a, there are some issues to really think about there. You know why? Why does God give commandments and rules? The God of freedom. You really need to resolve that. So, of course, we would say to inherit freedom and responsibility. Well, let's, let's break this down. Um, if I could get this to work. All right, here we go. How come it's not moving? Okay. I don't know why it's stuck. Okay, hold on, let me try. All right. Okay, here we go. All right, all right, there we go, okay. Thank you. All right, so, now the, the, the biblical story, Genesis uh, 2.25 talks about the fall of the first human ancestors. So, um, actually, can our volunteer, what is your name? Nikolai. Nikolai. Nikolai, can you read this for us? Right. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay, so the biblical story talks about time when the first human ancestors were not ashamed of, of their nakedness, and it was viewed as an idyllic time of no pain, no suffering, etc. Right? So that, that's, that's how the story is framed. And it, it says that God gave a commandment, which, uh, Nikolai, can you read for us? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou, thou shalt not eat of it. For on the day that thou, shalt, thou eatest, eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, yeah, the Elizabethans had interesting syntax. So. Yeah, so you can eat anything you want, but there's this one tree in the Garden of Eden that you cannot, you shouldn't eat the fruit from that, okay. So, now, 
the, the principal talks, uh, it looks for clues as to what is this tree, what does this, this symbolize? And so uh, there's a passage in uh, the book of Jude which talks about the sin of the angels, which are also you know, discussed in, in the biblical story. So, Nikolai, can you read that? And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains and darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, and set forth as an example of suffering, vengeance of the eternal fire, Okay, so it says, uh, this might be a new concept for people, but the, the biblical passage talks about angels giving themselves to fornication means sexual relationships uh, outside of marriage, basically, right? right? So, I mean, it's a kind of strange concept for people to think about the angels having sexual acts with each other, but the Bible does say that. All right. All right. Uh, all right, can you read this next passage? Now the serpent was more subtle than, the, than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the very, every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, uh, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall uh, not die, not surely die. Okay, so, I mean, it's interesting here. The, the, uh, there is a kind of suggestion or clue about why God is giving this commandment. It's not, it's really not, it, it does not appear that God is a, a dictator who wants to make the human beings miserable. He's warning them that this tree is dangerous and that you'll die if you eat, if you eat from this tree. Now, the question, of course, is, is this, is this a test where God's going to punish them with death? Or is there something about what, he do, what they should not eat from that would lead to, to their death? And that, that's kind of an interesting discussion there. And of course, the serpent is saying, well, you know, God said that, but actually God is not being, God's hiding something from you, actually, right? God is, God's not being honest with you, God's trying to, he, and I, I believe in the next one, yeah, okay, let's, and where, where this is, he's revealing why God is withholding information from you, all right. Yes. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree... Okay, we just stop, stop for a second there. Okay, so the reason that God is censoring this inf information, doesn't want you to know this, is because... He doesn't want, he knows that your eyes will be opened if you eat from this tree, and then you'll be as gods. So God is trying to prevent you from gaining awareness and consciousness. God wants to be the only God, and he wants to keep you in a subservient position. He's hiding from you. Okay, so the, look, look, this is, uh, these serpents explanation of God's motivation. It's a selfish motivation. All right, let's keep on going. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for, was for good, for, good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. All right, so she's persuaded by the... the uh, the, the angel, the serpent, and, and says the eyes of them both were opened and then they knew that they were naked. So this is quite interesting type of, their eyes are opened and they have a certain awareness they did not have before. And then what did they do immediately after? They, they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. 
I'm sorry, I, I read part of your, uh, that's your job, <laughs> sorry. But they, uh, what is an apron, uh, what is an apron covering, actually? You wear an apron, hmm? Yeah, well, I mean, people wear aprons when they're cooking, right? Yeah. So, I was, I was trying to think about, I don't really cook too much, so I have to really think about this. And, but they, they don't want to get their, their shirt and their pants or dress covered with food, right? So it is their front, the front parts, right? Okay. Why did they hide their, hide their lower parts? Because it was with lower parts that the sin was committed. So in the beginning, they began naked, unashamed, and then they, they become ashamed of their nakedness, and then it says, God, God called out to Adam, said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So Adam is ashamed. And uh, they're both ashamed. They both know they're naked. They're ashamed of their, their sexual parts, actually. So the motivation of fall, as we've all studied thousands of times, is the, the uh, Lucifer feels a lack of love, and therefore he decides to spiritually seduce Eve. They, they, they have a, a, a sexual, uh, this is kind of a, a strange concept for people, I think. The angel has a sexual, there's some type of sexual interaction between Lucifer, the archangel, and, and Eve. Um, I mean, this is actually, you could actually have a big discussion. There is literature about human beings having sexual relationships with um, spirits, uh, but that's another discussion. So uh, the result was guilt, fear, dread, angelic wisdom. Um, w w the wisdom is the misuse of love. And then uh, with Adam and Eve, I'm not gonna go through the whole discussion, but Eve being seduced by, by the archangel and then seducing Adam to also engage in a sexual relationship. Um, they inherited Lucifer's fallen inclinations, fallen nature became Satan's children, Satan became the owner of the world. This is the divine principle uh, interpretation. So, why did God give the commandment so they could perfect their character, uh, to bind them with God alone, to protect them against the fall? Uh, in their immature state, God cannot govern Adam and Eve directly through love. Because love is greater than principle, God gave the commandment in order to prevent the fall. So I'm not going to go through the entire uh, dynamics. but And the principle teaching, again, is that this commandment was only needed during the, the growth period. They would not have needed that had they become mature. Now, the question I want to ask now is, is this biblical story, is this relevant to our lives today? So, I, I mean, it's quite an interesting story. I'm sure the atheists would say, that's a really interesting story. This means nothing to me at all. And I, I would argue that a significant part of the population would also say, I don't even know if there was Adam and Eve, you know, I, these two people that you're talking about. <laughs> you know, a lot of questions. Uh, although I have to say that the uh, genetic researchers have, th there's been a lot of articles uh, and books out which point out that we're all related to a woman in Africa. Somewhere in Africa, there was a woman, and we're, we're all ancestors of this woman, right? Lucy. Lucy. Oh, they call her Lucy. <laughs> okay. So, so I, anyway, it's interesting. But, all right, so let, let's discuss this. I, I'd like to kind of just shift our conversation now to the world that we live in and just, I could talk for hours about this, but I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about it. All right. So... Does, does uncommitted sex hurt people? That, that's a bottom line in my mind. And so, of course, you know, there's the, the issue of AIDS and all kinds of disease. I'm not even going to talk about that part of it because don't, we don't have time. 
But what about the emotional damage to young men and young women from having sex, uncommitted sex, before marriage? Okay, a, a 2005 study found that sexually active high school uh, girls in high school are three times more likely to, be, to become depressed and to attempt suicide. Okay. Now, so there's a lot of pressure in our culture to, for sexual rights for young people. Um, and the, the, uh, the idea is, well, the only thing you really need to worry about is, you know, use a condom and protect your, so-called protect yourself from those diseases. And that's the only thing you need to really worry about. Of course, if we understand uh, do condoms protect you against depression? Do condoms protect you against the desire to kill yourself? Obviously not. Um, if they're having sex and also using drugs, there's even higher rates of depression. Those with multiple sex partners are 11 times more depressed. Interesting. What about high school, um, guys in high school? Sexually active high school uh, young men are three times more likely to, to be depressed if they're smoking and having sex, alcohol and sex, sex and drugs. Uh, binge drinkers are five times more depressed. Using other drugs, nine times more depressed. They're more likely to drop out of school, less to told achievement. It's not quite the same emotional impact on guys as on, as on girls. Uh, I'll explain more about this in a second. Risk behaviors precede depression. Previously, psychologists believed that youth self-medicated their depression by using drugs and having sex, but we now understand the reverse is true. Experimentation with sex and drugs damages the mental health of girls. In other words, girls who are actually pretty happy and, and not depressed, if they start to experiment with, with uncommitted sex in high school, they become depressed. This is a really important you know, thing to understand. And the ones in, the same, in this particular study I'm talking about, the same girls who did not experiment with sex are not becoming depressed. With, with boys, it's a little bit different. Experimentation by itself does not lead to depression in boys. Persistent involvement with sex, alcohol, and drug use does lead to their their depression and unhappiness and, and those negative emotions. And one more thing I want to talk about is about sex and brain conditioning. Uh, psychologist Douglas Weiss uh, from Denver, Colorado, he says that consistent viewing of anything or anyone during a sexual experience creates a sexual desire for that object or person. He actually says that your first sexual experiences are imprinted on, the, the br on your brain. There's a part of the prefrontal cortex called the, the preoptic neuron. I really have no idea what that is. I haven't studied it, the physiology of the brain, but it's a part of the brain. And he says those images uh, of your first sexual experiences are imprinted on the brain, okay? Now, the reason that he's concerned about this is because he counseled, he counsels hundreds, hundreds of married couples every year who are having problems in their marital sexual relationship. And he says that at 95% of the, these cases, uh, these couples who are having trouble in their marital re sexual relationship, it's the man started using pornography when he was a young teenager, or even, er, even earlier. And he says that because the, the, the men were essentially arousing themselves by looking at these images of naked women, these images are being kind of burned into their, their consciousness. Then fast forward 10 or 15 years later when they're in the age when they would like to get married and, and, and start a family. Uh, and they may not really realize there's a problem or they may be hiding it. Uh, there's this tragic story I heard of about a man who had a severe porn addiction uh, as a teenager. And it was almost every single day he was using pornography, actually, every single, during high school. And, 
He knew it, was a it affected his relationships, even his work habits, a lot of things. And he thought, maybe if I get married, this will, you know, I, I start having marital life with a, a real woman, I won't have this problem. So he got married to this beautiful young woman, and they have a beautiful wedding, and then they're, they're in their honeymoon suite, and his wife is getting ready to, I, I don't know exactly whether this is the very first time they're having sexual intercourse or not, but this is certainly the first time as a married couple. So she, she's getting herself ready to be with her, her husband for the first time. And then her husband says, you know, I...